This episode of our show has been sponsored by Eldermancy, who are about to put out their new Sunken Isles on Kickstarter, coming in February 2022. Sunken Isles is a seafaring adventure for 5th edition that takes your adventure through a magical island chain with a mysterious deity. This book is also going to include lots of new rules for ships and naval combat. This adventure has been headed up by Logan, uh, one of our fellow YouTubers, his channel, Runesmith, you should definitely check it out uh, as well. And the Sunken Isles adventure really draws on some different and uh, unique inspiration from what we typically see in your average seafaring adventure. So this is definitely one to t keep an eye on. You can follow the links in the description below to be notified when the Kickstarter goes live. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for DMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today we are looking at how to play a Clockwork Soul Sorcerer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. This timely subclass was introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and it brings the force of order to the chaotic world of the Sorcerer. So it's time to get into this because this subclass has a lot of moving gears behind it. We're going to talk about what races, backgrounds, and ability scores to choose, as well as the subclass features, the meta magics, the feats, and the spells that you might want to pick to bring your Clockwork Soul Sorcerer to life. There's a lot to bring together, but when everything is moving in sync, this just might be one of our favorite classes of all time. So with the Sorcerer, you get to choose your subclass right away at first level. So we're jumping in at our first level build. Uh, we get two features right away, one of which is the iconic expanded spell list that the Tasha's Sorcerers saw added onto them. And not only that, but the Sorcerers gain an ability that allows them to negate advantage or disadvantage. Yeah, Restore Balance is a fun little ability that lets you cancel out magic resistance in your foes. But the real meat here is Clockwork Magic, because not only is this an expanded spell list, but it works like a cleric's domain in that these are added to your sorcerer spells known. There are two spells that you gain from every level, from first to fifth level spells, but there's some extra special sauce added on top. Well, there are some really good spells in the Clockwork Magic spell list. Things like Aid and Wall of Force and Greater Restoration are some of my favorites. Each time you gain a level in Sorcerer, you can swap one of the spells out granted by Clockwork Magic for an Abjuration or Transmutation spell of the same level. Abjuration and Transmutation stand out to me as two of the most powerful schools of magic in the game, with some of the best spells. So not only do you get to pick and choose as you level up, but you can also pilfer some of your premium picks from the Warlock and Wizard spell list, as well as the Sorcerers. So one of the complications that we're going to look at as we level up our Clockwork Soul Sorcerer is not only how great the expanded spell list is, but what spells we might want to swap out as we move forward. We're going to be looking at the character at 1st level, 5th level, 10th level, and 15th level. And through most of the character's career, this spell list is going to double the number of spells we know. And we're also going to be able to pair these with our amazingly powerful meta magic options. But we do have to start at the core with our ability scores and our character race. So where do we get we begin with that? I think that character race, there's a lot of great options here for half elves, variant humans, but the one that really stood out to me is in Tasha's we got the custom lineage. Yeah. And I think that that's a great pick for the Clockwork Soul Sorcerer. Yes, because it's gonna give us a feat as well as a plus two bonus to an ability score of our choice. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna make our strength eight, our dexterity and constitution 14. Sorcerers gain proficiency in constitution saving throws, so I'd like to have a higher con, but eh, we'll deal with it. Um, we're gonna max out our charisma at 15, put the plus two in there, send that to 17, and then choose whether you wanna have int or whiz at eight or 10, however you wanna go about it. But then we're going to layer on the bonus feat that we get from the custom lineage. I think that a great pickup here for a few thematic and potent building options is telekinetic. Now, the thing that I love about telekinetic is not only are you gaining an additional plus one to your charisma, now putting your charisma at 18, 
But also when we think of a clockwork soul sorcerer and their ability to kind of manipulate the order of things around them, telekinetic almost works with them messing with time, if you want to reflavor it like that, where mm -hmm. they get to move as a bonus action people around the battlefield. And you're going to see that as we build this character, this is the theme of our clockwork soul sorcerer. Putting everything into its proper place and proper time. It also gives us Mage Hand, uh, expanding our number of cantrips. And speaking of cantrips, we're going to round out the rest of our cantrips with Prestidigitation, Minor Illusion, uh, Mind Spike, and Ray of Frost. Ray of Frost is really key because with the ability to push someone five feet as a bonus action with Telekinetic and also hit them with Ray of Frost and slow their speed by 10 feet, we have a really cool one-two punch of battlefield control that we can start applying here. And even just relying on this without using your sorcery points or other spells, you can do some really, really tricky things with just these two things at will. And that'll give you a really fun package just right away at first level. But we still do have to pick two other first level spells. We're stuck with alarm and protection from uh, evil and good right now at first level. But what are the other two spells that we picked? At first level, you're probably going to want to pick up whatever your favorite damage dealing or control spell is, but I think the primary pickup here might be Grease. Grease is an underrated spell and usually not a primary pickup, but again, if we look at the package that we're already building with Telekinetic being able to move people five feet, our uh, Ray of Frost being able to slow them down, we can move people onto the Grease, have them trip and fall and land prone, hit them with Ray of Frost, and now they have to spend half their movement to get up and might not have enough movement to get anywhere. Yeah, Grease creates just a small area of difficult terrain, but creatures that enter it or start their turns in there have to make a dexterity saving throw, otherwise they fall prone. Well, if you have made an area of Grease, and then on subsequent turns you push someone into it with uh, Telekinetic, They've moved into the grease, so now they do have to make a dexterity saving throw or fall over. And if they're still standing at the start of their next turn, they have to make it again. <laughs> and if you've reduced their speed by 10 feet with Ray of Frost in another turn, well, they got to stand up, lose, their, lose half their speed from that, lose 10 feet from their speed from Ray of Frost, and they're in a small puddle of difficult ground. Best of all, Grease doesn't require concentration and it lasts for a minute. And with all of these components in play, we already have the battlefield control that is going to operate like a well-oiled machine. So with that, let's bump up to fifth level and make some key choices. As we level up, we are going to want to start dumping away the not so good spells that we get from the Clockwork Souls expanded spell list. Right away, we're going to retrain out Alarm and Protection from Evil and Good for Mage Armor and Shield. We are also going to retrain out Lesser Restoration for Levitate. Levitate's a great way to just take a melee-only enemy out of the fight because they just rise up into the air, bob there, and you can shoot them to your heart's content and they can't get down. Also hitting 5th level, we're going to retrain Protection from Energy out for Haste. And let's talk about some of the other spells we might pick. Bear in mind that all this is just retraining the spells that we got from being a Clockwork Soul. Now we actually get to pick the other spells that we want to have. And you can retrain both the spells that you get as a Sorcerer and your Clockwork Soul spells. So actually each level you can retrain twice when you're leveling up your Sorcerer. So we get a really nice blanket of equipment here. I want to keep Grease all through the character's career. But I think we also want to lay the groundwork with two really key spells. First of all, I really want Tasha's Mind Whip. Tasha's Mind Whip is such a Clockwork Soul type spell, but I also think that we got to pick up the new spell Vortex Warp. Absolutely. Being able to grab enemies and place them where you need them to be on the battlefield. Again, this is the theme of the Clockwork Soul Sorcerer, putting things as they should be at all times. And let's combine that with web. So we can lay down a web and uh, either mind whip someone that's stuck in it to make it really hard to get out or vortex warp someone that's escaped it into there. And of course, we did get haste to speed up time. 
and we better take slow to slow down it because you can't be a clockwork soul without haste and slow as far as I'm concerned. I also think in the displacement of all people on the battlefield, you need to consider yourself. So I actually think that Thunderstep is a great pickup here. Not only does it dish out a great amount of damage, but it's a great teleportation spell. I would also reflavor it to make the Thunderstep sound like the thunderous crack of a bell. Like a, a clock bell. The yeah. clock strikes 12 as you yeah. disappear and reappear, bringing an ally with you if you need to. Yeah. Now, of course, we're going to pair this all with our meta magic, and this is really important because along the way we're also going to take a feat, which is going to be meta magic adept. This gives us two extra metamagic choices for a total of four and two more sorcery points. So what four metamagics are we going to take with this character? So my first pick for a metamagic, looking at the package of spells that we already have chosen, is going to be Twin Spell. Because Twin Spell is going to not only apply to some great picks like Vortex Warp and Mind Whip, but also our Haste and um, Levitate. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of great options here for Twin Spell. Being able to twin spell Vortex Warp and Mind Whip is probably going to be the bread and butter of this character for their entire playthrough. For, because twinning Vortex Warp for only two sorcery points is a bargain. And once you have that, that web, and we'll see later on other spells placed, being able to grab two enemies and just pop them into your web, mm. now you're stuck. Or you can not only could you grab one enemy and put them into your web, but then you could grab your fighter and put them beside the web so they can stab your enemy. So you could grab two enemies, two allies, an enemy, an ally, mix and match. It's an amazing way to mix things up. And being able to twin Mind Whip is just awesome. I kind of feel like I'm going to spend most of my, my sorcery points twinning Vortex Warp. But I do like having Subtle Spell. It's just weirdly useful. We're not really taking a lot of the social sort of spells with this character, but I want to have it on hand. Yeah. I also think Quicken Spell and Empowered Spell are iconic choices that every sorcerer should have. Now, you might also consider taking Extend Spell, if only to use it on Aid and Grease. Extend Spell only increases the duration of a spell with a duration of one minute or longer which Grease is. So you can have your Grease last twice as long. In the rare cases, you might need it to. Or you could have Aid last twice as long, which brings its duration up to 16 hours, which allows you to cast it before taking a short rest and still have it running during the next adventuring day. Bit of a niche pick, but worth mentioning. So with all of that, our Master of Control is really working like clockwork. But let's level them up to 10th level. Also on the way to 10th level, we're going to gain the 6th level feature, Bastion of Law. This allows you to create a ward that you can use 1 to 5 sorcery points to uh, mitigate damage either on yourself or an ally. Now, this is a ability that I might use in a pinch, but I think my sorcery points are going to be better used for all of the cool other things we're talking about. It's not a bad feature by any means. It's just hard to justify spending the sorcery points on it when you're going to be using so many sorcery points to twin stuff. So along the way, we are going to look at retraining options here. Now, at this point, your sorcerer has enough spells. You can really pick and choose your favorites, but you should keep in mind that Polymorph, Banishment, and Animate Objects are transmutation and abjuration spells. So being able to replace some of your less used spells from your expanded spell list for these iconic picks could be really beneficial. Yeah, freedom of movement, summon construct, dispel magic, and greater restoration are all given to you by your expanded spell list. And these are good spells. But if you don't like them as much as counterspell, banishment, polymorph, and animate objects, I totally forgive you. Regardless of whether you trained out for them or not, I think that all of those spells are ones that you do want in your sorcerer package here. Mm -hmm. I, I realize that when we're talking about the theme and all of that, Polymorph seems like the weird outlier, but I'm sorry, I can't not pack Polymorph. Yeah, if you do retrain out some of your other spells, you will end up with more room for picks like Fireball or Dimension Door or Synaptic Static if you want a little bit more offense. Another spell that I really like having in my arsenal here is Sickening Radiance, because again, we can put Sickening Radiance down and start vortex warping enemies into it, getting them stuck there by using Mind Whip and Ray of Frost uh, on top of that. 
um, and and then just using telekinetic to push them around back into it. So the core idea here of the Clockwork Soul is that we want to be able to have something like web or sickening radiance that we can push people into with our other spells and abilities and really keep them there while they kind of melt in the microwave. I like to imagine the sickening radiance in this case actually being more like the uh, the onslaught of time ravaging someone. Yeah, if you reflavor it to be just a, a, a space that is excelling time at an exponential rate where people are aging inside yeah. of it, yeah. uh, throwing them into this time bubble is, is such a cool way to picture it. I also want to point out again that grease doesn't require concentration. So if you have a spot of grease on the floor, cast Sickening Radiance on that point. <laughs> now they're slipping and falling inside of your time bubble while you're vortex warping, uh, telekineticing, and just keeping them in there. The rest of your party gets to line up on the outside and just create a wall to force them back in. Yeah, and you can do some really cool plays here by quickening spells when you don't need to twin them. So, for example, you could quicken something like Vortex Warp or Mind Whip to really put an enemy where you need them or keep them there. And then use your action to cast a Ray of Frost to slow them down even further. Because an enemy that's then been put into a puddle of grease in the middle of Sickening Radiance that has their speed reduced by 10 feet and then they're also mind whipped, it's really going to be hard for them to get out of that. And while that is a pretty substantial investment of your spells, the f fight's probably over at that point. <laughs> I think that there are other options along the way here, like Wall of Fire, but really the, the play here is the same. Yeah. You, you have an area spell that you can lay down and concentrate on while you throw your enemies into it. Yeah, and then you also are going to get Wall of Force, which is incredible. And you can really use your other spells now to help you get the most out of Wall of Force by, for example, adjusting the positioning of your enemies and allies so that you can capture the most enemies in a Wall of Force. It does require a little bit of planning to pull this off properly, um, but once you are able to do that, you can really make effective use of things like Vortex Warp or even just do something really simple like if someone is in your Wall of Force but it turns out they could teleport, they teleport out, you just grab them with Vortex Warp and dump them right back into it. So along the way, we're also getting another ASI or feat option, and I think it's worth it to just drive your charisma up to the max. You're already at 18, so one more uh, ASI along the way gets you to 20, which is just going to bring this all up to top level spellcasting. At 10th level, your Clockwork Soul Sorcerer with all these spells is going to feel like they are just the master of reality. I will note that when I played my Clockwork Soul, I also had access to the Graviturgy and Chronergy spells from Explorer's Guide to Wildemount. Uh, and there were some really cool options in there like Pulse Wave and Magnify Gravity that were super, super awesome and thematic. It was also ridiculously powerful. So <laughs> Yeah. I don't think they were taking those types of spells into account when designing the Clockwork yeah. Soul. So be aware of that if you are allowing the uh, the Wild Mount book at your table with a Clockwork Soul, there's some really dangerous play yeah. that you can do here. And also as well, by this level, we can also pick up Heightened Spell as our other meta magic option to impose disadvantage on a saving throw. And if you really want to be brutal, you could also get Silvery Barbs. And so this would allow you to do a really high level play where you impose disadvantage on a character's saving throw and also force them to re-roll it if it's still successful but unfortunately you can't use these with your restore balance feature because restore balance requires your reaction silvery barbs is a reaction there's still a lot of ways that you can play with this though as we move up to 15th level and get into that high tier play you get another feat or asi and i'd say that it's really hard not to take warcaster just as kind of an insurance policy on your constitution saving throws also in the rare chance that you are making those um opportunity attacks what spellcaster doesn't want to throw spells? Yeah, you could consider something else like Lucky here as well, um, or even just bumping up your constitution score. Probably past this point, that would be my top contenders for any future feats at, at 16th and 19th level. Also, as we move to level 15, we're going to get Trance of Order, which is an ability that we can activate as a bonus action that gives us the, this activates this trance that we're in for one minute that makes everything that happens to us super reliable. Yeah, no longer can anybody gain advantage against you. But also, when you make an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, any roll of 9 or lower is automatically a 10. 
This is a great feature. Yeah, you can normally only use it once per day, but you can spend five sorcery points to turn it on again. And this is actually an interesting case for not taking Warcaster, because under Trance of Order, with a good con score and proficiency in constitution saving throws, you really can't fail a concentration check. It's re or it's really unlikely that you would because the lowest roll you would get at this level would be a 17, which means you would need to take a single hit for 32 points of damage to even have a chance of failing. Our expanded spell list is now kind of locked in. We can still re retrain things out if we don't want them, but I probably am just gonna leave them there and I'm gonna take my existing spells that I know and start retraining some of those lower level spells to get more higher level spells uh, in here. Because one of the things with the Sorcerer is it's hard to get a lot of high level spells and there's a lot of great high level Sorcerer spells. So what are we gonna take? I think one of the iconic choices looking at the build we're making is gonna be Scatter. Uh, scatter is basically Vortex Warp leveled up. And yeah. now we can grab everybody on the battlefield and throw them where we need them yeah. to be. Up to five targets, just move them around within 120 feet, put them all together in one space or all together somewhere else. Um, the only thing that, again, that kind of sucks about it is that it's hard to use it with Quicken Spell because you can't, you can't do something where like you Quicken Scatter and then put all the enemies in one place and then drop a wall of force on them. Unfortunately, you can't do that with the way that the interaction between bonus action spells and leveled spells is. But, but I, I do love the play here where if you've done what we've already talked about, you have your Sickening Radiance and a bunch of people stuck in it, but you have a bunch of other people who have escaped it, Grabbing five of them and being Dropping like, no, them. you're going back in <laughs> yeah. is, is just such a great play. So I think Scatter is my iconic clockwork pick here. I think also I really like Mental Prison um, and it's a great spell to twin and it's a great spell to use for heightened spell. So it would be a tempting six level spell pick for me personally. Um, and as always, sorcerers are great for using spells like Sunbeam because again, you can quicken Sunbeam and fire it twice in the first round, um, and then one, and then quicken another spell and fire a Sunbeam in subsequent rounds. So it's it's really cool to use that if you need to deal some damage. As we move along, what would you take for seventh level spells? Uh, reverse gravity. Yeah. I think that. Again, you're messing with... Uh, it's less to do with time, but I still feel like it fits the vibe. Master of time and space. It, it, it does. Um, it's Again, it's harder for the sorcerer to find lots of ways to combo this out. Um, but again, you, you can just end up with that raw situation where you've reversed gravity in an area, and if anyone happens to get out of it, just vortex warp or scatter them back into it, and they shoot right up. The only thing that I think you kind of run into this weird difficulty with, with both vortex warp and reverse gravity, is that... Vortex Warp, you have to put them in somewhere there, there's a solid surface to stand on. So if you Vortex Warp someone onto the floor, which would normally be a fair place for them to go, but Reverse Gravity is pulling gravity in the other direction, do they fall back up? And if they hit a ceiling, can, like, how does that work? You know what I mean? Like, does, does Reverse Gravity actually invalidate the floor as a valid target for Vortex Warp? Interesting question. Um, I'd allow it. It's fun. Yeah. But some other great high-level options here. I feel like this one's less thematic, but I just want to shout out uh, Draconic Transformation. Uh, it's a great high-level sorcerer spell. And yeah, it doesn't really make that much sense that your Clockwork Soul Sorcerer is turning into a flying, fire-breathing dragon. I can't really chalk that up to time manipulation. Akatosh in the Elder Scrolls universe is the dragon of time. You are the dragon of time. We're, we're stretching. But, yeah. <laughs> but it's there. Find it, figure it out. Uh, but it's still such a cool spell. Yeah. I also think teleport. Yeah, I think teleport's just a, a toolkit spell that you want to have in your arsenal. Um, eighth level spells are really hard for sorcerers. There's, there's not a lot that I really like here. I'm always tempted to look at incinerary cloud, but I do think that you actually get more value of picking up more of those seventh level options mm -hmm. and thinking about ways that you can upcast some of your spells. Yeah, and, and as we move into the ninth level spells, you're obviously going to take Wish because that's just the standard tactic to take with the Sorcerer so that you can then access all those other really juicy spells that you'd like. Um, but you're also going to be really disappointed that uh, Prismatic Wall is only for Wizards. 
<laughs> yeah, prismatic wall would have been cool. I also think that there is an option here looking at lower level spells. We didn't talk about Bigby's hand. It is mm. tough to make the case to concentrate on that rather than another yeah. spell. But uh, it's still a pretty cool pickup that was added to the Sorcerer spell list. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things with the Clockwork Soul is having played both the Clockwork Soul and a, a, a similar style control wizard. The Clockwork Soul is amazing and powerful and as their apex of power at around 10th level. But it's interesting how the high level wizard spells that wizards get like wizards get force cage, they get the they get contingency, they get the uh prismatic wall and so I feel like the wizard still kind of overtakes the clockwork soul, but the clockwork souls because most campaigns happen between level 1 and 13 it's, it's hard to deny the power of the Clockwork Soul. I mean, I still think that we need the place for wizards to be the, the aged masters mm. of reality. So the, the older they get, the further they get in their levels, they should be the most powerful spellcaster, in my opinion. But the Clockwork Soul Sorcerer, in my opinion, uh, playing them as a battlefield controller and in this way of just manipulating space and time yeah. constantly is such a cool and thematic way to play them and really powerful. Yeah, and you just see really, really simple things. Like, a really simple strategy that you can use even at earlier levels is slow. Is such a brutal spell when you can take those slowed enemies and pick them up with Vortex Warp and put them somewhere where they're not going to be able to do anything. Or yeah. when a slowed enemy gets hit with Tash's Mind Whip and then is just completely ineffective. Or when you're just hasting up your allies in the other direction. I, I really think that the Clockwork Soul, interestingly enough, when Mind Whip, Twin Spell, and Vortex Warp are layered on top of slow, you really see the power of that spell manifest. Not to mention, I think, looking back at the cantrips, being able to just spam Ray of Frost when you have slow going on or something mm -hmm. of that sort, just increasing the level of difficulty for anybody to move anywhere. Yeah. Ray of Frost is usually not my go-to cantrip, but there's something about it on this character Yes, that just makes so much sense and feels iconic. And then you always have that bonus action nudge with telekinetic. You could even actually, speaking of other cantrips, you could grab Gust which also is another way of pushing someone five feet. So you can really get this really interesting ability to just nudge people around in position. And the combination of all of these things on a single character that can really make use of them effectively because I think you could do all this with a wizard, but the fact that the sorcerer gets to twin and quicken these things just amps it up to the next level. So this has been a look at the Clockwork Soul Sorcerer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you've played a Clockwork Soul Sorcerer, tell us about your favorite choices you made in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider supporting our show by following the links in the description below. Don't forget to check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more guides for building characters in D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.